Beloved, welcome to this um, special video, a video in which we are going to be exploring one of the fundamental teachings of the Lutheran Church in Zimbabwe, in, in Canada. Uh, you all pardon me there. I'm so much used to Zimbabwe. Nonetheless, it is on not only the understanding of the Lutheran Church in Canada, but the understanding of Lutherans worldwide. So we're going to explore the issue, the issue of sacraments. And um, as we explore the issue of sacraments, we'll begin to see and appreciate some, if not most of the things that we do in, in our worship. Um, so first and foremost, we'd love to define what a sacrament is. Would love to define what a sacrament is. So, by definition, a sacrament is an act. First of all, a sacrament is an act that is instituted by God or Jesus Christ in which we have, um, in which we have the forgiveness of sin or the dispensation of grace. So, we begin to see that sacraments are God's act. It is an act of God. So first and foremost, we have to understand that in the sacraments, it is not us who are acting, but it is God who is acting towards humanity in a bid to extend grace to humanity, in a bid to extend forgiveness forgiveness and eternal life so the first thing we have to understand is that a sacrament is an act of god it is an act of god so god is acting and um the the word sacrament comes from the latin root sacramentum which has got um which has got roots in a word that is also translated mystery so we find this mystery in which we see God acting in a very unique way. And God acts in this way. God acts through elements. What we call elements are the things that we see in sacraments. And we are going to explore them a little bit further. But in the sacrament of baptism, for example, we have got an element called water. So water becomes an element that is very crucial in, in baptism. And the sacrament of the Lord's table, we have got bread and wine. Those are the elements that, that, that we have. And so we see God acting through this, these elements to extend God's mercy and God's grace to humanity. So that becomes a very uh, unique mystery in, in sacraments. The second thing that I want to amplify is that a sacrament is instituted by God. A sacrament is instituted by God. And when we're going to be exploring, we, um, when we're going to be exploring the sacraments, namely the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the Holy Communion or the Eucharist or the Lord's table, um, you will begin to see how God um, instituted the sacraments. The third thing is that in the sacraments, God extends God's mercy, loving kindness, and forgiveness to humanity. So the elements that we have have got a role to play. And the role that these elements play is that they extend God's mercy God's kindness and forgiveness to humanity. So when we partake of the sacraments, when we participate in the sacraments, we become recipients of God's grace. We become recipients of God's kindness. So that is, that is basically what defines a sacrament. And then we would have a typical question of what is a sacrament? You, you, you will begin to see that in the Lutheran tradition, we have got two sacraments. As I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the sacrament of 
the Holy Communion, which is the Lord's table, and the sacrament of baptism. Those are the two sacraments that stand. In the Lutheran tradition, again, we had absolution and forgiveness, which is the office of keys, which was once regarded as a sacrament. But then it fell short in terms of um, the definition of a sacrament. Because in a sacrament, we have got elements. We have got elements that become a conduit of God's grace. And in the office of keys, there, there was no, there was no, um, there was, the, the, there were no elements. And so you would find out that um, it fell, it fell away as a sacrament. And secondly, there is no way in the Bible um, that uh, Jesus institutes, uh, institutes uh, forgiveness, confession, and absolution as a sacrament although this is very very important you will find out that in our worship services particularly in all the in in all the lutheran traditions all across the world worship begins with for confession forgiveness and absolution because it is a very important part of our christian journey in fact the reverend dr martin luther once said that his desire was for every Christian to creep back to their baptismal font. In other words, to go back to confession. One of the pillars of uh, the 95 Thesis is that the, the, the first thesis, when our Lord Jesus Christ said, come, he willed that the life of a believer be a life of repentance. So that is very key, but it is not a sacrament. What are the two sacraments that we have? We have got the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the Eucharist. So, now we just want to explore a bit further um, the sacrament of baptism. The sacrament of baptism. Now, what is baptism? What is baptism? Let's start from the definition of the word baptism. The word baptism comes from a Greek word baptizo, baptizo, which means to immerse in order to cleanse, to cleanse, to wash away. That is, that is, um, that is baptizo. But then in baptism as a sacrament, we find out that in one of the critical elements of baptism is water. One of the critical elements of baptism is water. And now, in baptism, we have water. But baptism is not just water. Baptism is not just water. But baptism is water that is, that is conjoined with the word of God. Baptism is not just water, but it is water that is conjoined, water together with the word of God. When you bring the word of God and water, you have baptism because the water begins to have not only an outward, um, an outward um, expression of making us wet on the head or making us wet the whole body when we are immersed in water but it also has a spiritual function of cleansing us so we need to understand beloved that it is not just the water that is important for anyone can just jump into water when you when you jump into a swimming pool and you swim and you are immersed in water it's not baptism because the word is not present what makes water to have the efficacy the value the rationale the importance is the word that is attached to it and this is the mystery that I want you, beloved, to understand. That the book of John chapter 1 
And the first verse says, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And without this word, nothing was created. When you go down through the same chapter, you'll begin to understand in verse 13, 14. It, the Bible says, and the word became flesh. In other words, the word came to become Jesus and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. So the mixture of the word and the water brings God into the washing effect of our hearts. So we need to understand this very clearly. That baptism brings us to a point of forgiveness. And we have to understand that as I said earlier on in the introduction, this is an act of God and not our act. It is God acting. It is God cleansing our hearts. Why do we need this cleansing? Because the Bible tells us that we are birthed, we are born with iniquity through the sin of the first Adam, which can only be cancelled by the remission of sin through the second Adam, who is Jesus, who is, and Jesus is the word, and the word is mixed with water, and it cleanses us from the sin of the first Adam. So we begin to learn the importance and the efficacy of baptism. But also what I want us to understand, beloved, is that baptism should not be treated as an event, but baptism should be treated as a lifetime event process we are cleansed the first time when we are immersed or when we are sprinkled or poured water upon and this becomes our lifestyle each and every day when we confess our sins and come before God and acknowledge that we are weak, we are sinners, we, are, we have sinned against God and so we ask for God's forgiveness. And God is so wonderful and marvelous that God pardons us. God cleanses us from all righteousness. So the next time that we have a thanksgiving for communion in service, we have to have this consciousness that this is very important because it takes us on a life journey of repentance, remorse, and ultimately the forgiveness from God. So, in baptism, Jesus, as the word, becomes the active ingredient. Jesus, as the word, becomes the active ingredient. So, when you are making bread, for example, you make a dough. And in that dough, for it, for it in, order, in order for it to rise, in order for it to make a nice loaf of bread, you add in an active ingredient ingredient called yeast. Yeast is active in the door because the yeast be begins to have life in it. The yeast is not dead and it has life and it brings in the life into the door and the door begins to rise and it makes a nice loaf of bread. Let's bring it back home to our own lives in terms of baptism. The word of God is the yeast in baptism. And when the yeast is mixed with the word, when the word of God, which is the yeast, is mixed with the door, which is the water, and it comes into our lives, we receive the life that is in the word through the water. We receive the life that is in the word through the water. So I need us to understand that the most important aspect of it is 
the word. Let me give us another example. When you go to, a, to the hospital sometimes, the doctor will prescribe that you get an injection. So they will take the injection and fill the syringe with medicine. And they will inject it into your body. The injection is a career of the medicine that is supposed to make you well. So take it as this. The water is the career of the word that is brought into our lives so that we can become well. What a mystery. And I believe that um, we'll be able to understand this and appreciate this. Let's move over to the next sacrament. The sacrament of the Eucharist. The sacrament of the Eucharist. In the sacrament of the Eucharist, just like, just like in the sacrament of baptism, we have elements. The two elements that we have, we have, we have the bread, we have the bread, and we have the cup or the wine. And sometimes you would find that we will find out that um, we have these little cups that that we have, which resemble the big cup. Now, but what I want us to understand are the two major elements, the bread and the wine. The bread and the wine. Now, these elements, just like, uh, just like um, in baptism, they carry the grace of God. They carry the grace of God. They carry the mercy, the loving kindness, the forgiveness, the forgiveness of sin. And this is, this is, this is very important for us to, to, to understand. Now, on the sacrament of the altar, we need to understand that the sacrament of the altar is the true body. So the bread resembles the body and the blood and, and, and the wine resembles the blood of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is present in the Eucharist, not only in it, but also under it and over it. God is like a wrapping package, but it's, it's so unique in that he's not only wrapping around the Eucharist, but he is, God is also in the Eucharist. It's, it's a very uh, deep mystery. So when, we, so when we eat and partake of the bread and the wine, we partake of Jesus Christ. How do we do this? We receive Jesus in, with, and under the elements of the Holy Communion through faith. Through faith. So faith becomes very, very important in, um, in receiving Jesus Christ. But we also need to understand that the Bible tells us that this is not our faith. This is not our faith, but it is the faith that we are given by the faith that we are given by God. The Bible tells us that God allots, God gives, God um, apportions to every person a measure, a measure of faith. And um, we, we need to understand that it is Jesus Christ who instituted um, the Lord's table or the Eucharist or the sacrament of Holy Communion. If you go, if you turn your Bibles to First uh, Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse twenty-three and twenty-four, it says, "I received from the Lord what also I passed to you." This is Paul speaking. I received from Jesus what I am passing also to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night that he was betrayed, 
he took the bread and when he had given thanks when he, he had prayed he broke it and said to his disciples take and eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me and also in the same meal jesus took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the remission or for the forgiveness for the cleansing of human sin do this in remembrance of me so we do this as christ's salutary command to remember him not only to remember but also to partake of christ's nature when we partake of christ's nature we become more and more like christ and when we become more and more like christ we copy christ and we begin to take the nature of christ thus forgiveness comes upon our our, our lives so it is very important to understand that in the eucharist we receive forgiveness of sins in the book of matthew the gospel of matthew chapter 26 uh, verses 26 to 28 um, jesus tells his disciples that when we do this the bread and the wine we receive uh, we receive God's forgiveness when he says this is my body this is my blood for the remission of sin uh, and and so this this becomes this becomes very very important now I want us to move over to try to figure out the importance the rationale just as we did with uh, with baptism of um, what what then is what then is the importance of the eucharist first and foremost when we say in the night in which jesus was betrayed he took bread and after he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples the breaking of the bread is very significant because it signifies that christ sacrificed christ's self for my life and when we distribute the bread and the wine we would say this is the body of jesus christ broken for you you is not plural but you singular for you the body of jesus christ is broken for you and we need to understand this it brings to us a consciousness and an understanding that christ was broken for me christ was broken for me and why was christ broken for me for the forgiveness of sin so that my sins could be forgiven so that my sins could be forgiven so whenever we partake of the eucharist we receive salvation through the elements of the eucharist not only not only that but also we enter into a covenant jesus says this this cup this is my blood which is a new covenant so when we partake of the meal and drink of his blood we enter into a new covenant with jesus christ which is a new arrangement a new contract and this contract is bound by the love of god the contract of the new testament is bound by the love of god it is not about so much about what we do but it is so much about what god does to us so we enter into a, a covenant or a contract and in this contract jesus forgives us of all our sins and when we are forgiven humanity and creation become reconciled with god remember remember my sisters i talked about how humanity was separated because of sin and was separated from uh, from god and so when we partake of the eucharist 
we receive that blessing. We receive that blessing and enter into a covenant. And when we enter into a covenant, uh, we are reconciled with God. We are reconciled with God. And this is, this is so, so um, important for us to, to understand. And so, just like any other, just like baptism, these elements without the word of God, they mean nothing. This just becomes bread and this just becomes wine or grape juice. But when Jesus Christ comes, when the Spirit of God comes and rests in with and under the elements, we receive Jesus Christ. We receive the mercy of God. We receive God's loving kindness. And this releases a blessing upon our life. It releases a supernatural blessing over, over our life. So I just want to, as I conclude, I just want us to see how we can... Um, how, how, how we can receive the sacraments worthily. How we can receive the sacraments worthily. But as I, as I go to that, I, I want to stand here in the middle and make some emphasis on how, um, on how God instituted the baptism on one hand and the Lord's table on the other. In Matthew chapter 28, we hear Jesus instructing his disciples and us also, as we are Jesus' disciples, go ye therefore and baptize them. Go and preach to every person, starting in Samaria, in Judea, up to the uttermost parts of the world, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is Matthew chapter 28, verse number 16 and mark chapter 16 verse 16 that's where you would find that command and as jesus is as jesus is about to go he um he institutes the lord's supper you remember um the last meal that jesus had with his disciples he sat down and he talked so many things and amongst those things he said among you there is one person who is going to um to sell me out or betray me and he had he had this wonderful meal in which he said the words this is my body that is broken for you and he also said this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the entire world for the remission of sin and he concludes by saying do this in remembrance of me so whenever that we celebrate whenever that we celebrate the sacraments we remember Jesus in the sense not, not in the sense of an activity in the past but also an activity in the present and we are not reenacting what happened in the past because Christ is doing a new thing each and every time in a person's life when we partake at the Lord's table. So, like I said, I want us to move towards I want us to move towards how to receive the sacraments worthily. One of the things that is very important and that stands out for me is for us to come to the Lord's table with a pertinent heart. We cannot forgive ourselves, but we come with the understanding that when we partake at the Lord's table, when we come to the waters of baptism, God is going to cleanse us. We come with that faith. We come with that conviction. On some, some, some of the things, my personal practice is when I come to the Lord's table, I fast because I want to prepare my outward my outward being and my inward being to come in fellowship to be in fellowship with jesus christ because in the communion we have fellowship with jesus christ when we are walking in the light 
as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another that's what the bible says in the book of first john and believe you me this is a very important practice for me and it's very good for it's very good for for discipline for for personal um, discipline god wants us to believe that we come to the lord's table for the remission of sin for the remission of sin god wants to forgive us this this shows us something very very important that both the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the eucharist are bound by one important thing and that thing is love god loves us and god wants to fellowship with you and i always encourage people that we should go beyond the fellowship at the lord's table the disciples fellowship fellowship with jesus at the lord's table as a clique but you also have to have fellowship with jesus at a personal and intimate level this fellowship at the table should equip us of one important thing that community is very important but your personal relationship with god is more important the christian community comes together to fellowship with god the almighty in the waters of baptism and also through the fellowship at the table but also we have to have that intimate fellowship uh, together with god lastly i want to deal with the issue of confirmation confirmation what is confirmation then confirmation is a public rite of the church that is preceded by instruction so you'd find out that before confirmation people come for confirmation class and they are taught on scripture they are taught on the school catechism and uh, this brings understanding of how to walk the christian faith and how to live in the christian community the right of confirmation provides an opportunity for an individual christian to rely on god's providence god's love god's loving kindness and it helps us to understand who we are it affirms our faith that we confess each time that we um that we do the apostles creed or the nicene creed that confirmation becomes a right to lead us and to begin a journey of faithfulness to god so i invite you to start thinking and meditating on the word of god i want us to understand that confirmation is not just is 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 not just a rite of passage into adulthood but confirmation is a beginning of a journey with jesus christ let's treat confirmation as a as an epoch a marker a milestone in our journey with jesus christ i have noticed so many a time that when people are confirmed they no longer come to church because they have not realized that confirmation is not a rite of passage into adulthood but not but rather it is a marker of the beginning of our journey with jesus christ when we begin to journey with jesus christ with understanding beloved i believe that you will be able to comprehend the three things that we spoke about today the sacrament of baptism the sacrament of the eucharist and the rite of confirmation may god bless you and may god enrich you in jesus mighty name allow me beloved to conclude with prayer as i pray with you may god bless you and may god enrich you may the lord keep you may the lord's face shine upon you may the lord cover you with grace and loving kindness i pray lord god for understanding 
as we have journeyed in this journey as a confirmation class learned about scripture we learned about the bible we learned about the nature of jesus christ the love of god god's providence god's kindness as we conclude this journey and begin yet another journey of faith help us to continue to grow from one level of grace to another in jesus mighty name amen May God bless you and may God enrich you in Jesus' name. Amen.